So um, welcome everybody to the second session of this year's Goldsmiths Annual Philosophy Lectures. My name is Julia Ng and I co-direct the Center for Philosophy and Critical Thought together with my colleagues Alberto Toscano and Vicky Bell. We're very pleased to be able to host Professor Monique Debbie Mena as our third annual speaker, as well as Professor Alan Pottage as this evening's respondent. I would also like to take this opportunity to once again thank Darian Leader and the Center for Freudian Analysis and Research for their co-sponsorship of our lectures this year. For those of us joining us tonight for the first time, the Center for Philosophy and Critical Thought was founded in 2015 as a forum for a distinctly and affirmatively transdisciplinary way of doing philosophy. Regarding philosophy as a plural and critical activity that dialogues with disciplines and publics outside of academic philosophy, CPCT shares with Goldsmiths a commitment to public and political engagement and an openness to new forms of criticality in creative inquiry. Alongside our program of guest lectures and workshops throughout the year, we run a year long research seminar, the theme of which this year was critiques of violence, as well as an annual conference, which this year will take place over the course of six days starting next week on the 2nd of June. I just want to very, very briefly um, show you the poster here. Um, for those of you who are interested, you can find out more information by visiting our website and also register for it at cpct.uk. Okay, back to us. Tonight, we are delighted to have Professor Monique David Mena deliver the third of our annual philosophy lectures. Since the transdisciplinary nature of her work, we feel uniquely captures and advances the type of inquiry that CPCT is committed to. Before we begin, I would like to invite attendees to please use the Q&A function to either type out your question, in which case we can then read it out for you, or to indicate that you would like to speak live, in which case we'll you know, facilitate that, obviously. Uh, and now um, I'll hand over to Alberto Toscano to briefly reintroduce our speaker for this evening. Okay, um, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Monique David Menard back uh, to deliver her second annual lecture on the topic of animism of the unconscious on the animism of property in modern right. This will be followed, as uh, Julia has just mentioned, by a response by Professor Alan Potage, who, will, who Julia will introduce after Monique's talk. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, Julia provided us with a very rich and suggestive introduction to the range of Professor David Menard's research and publications. Uh, I won't try to repeat or match it here, but I do refer those of you who weren't with us on Tuesday to the full recording of the first lecture, which you can find on our YouTube channel. Now, the talks that make up this year's annual lectures are drawn from Professor David Menard's most recent book, published in French last summer, La vie sociale des choses, l'animisme et les objets, the social life of things, animism, and its objects. A book that ranges beyond the clinical and speculative insights that she draws on from her practice as a psychoanalyst, the source of much of Tuesday's discussion and of her exchanges with Darian Leader, and her extremely original exploration into the anthropology of property and uh, into Hegel's work, some of which she will stage today. They also provide suggestive and challenging readings of the place of property and objects in the works of the very young uh, Marx writing on the theft of wood, as well as an incisive reflection on the meanings of political emancipation today. In this sense, the book and these lectures builds upon a distinctive approach to the relationship between psychoanalysis and philosophy, indeed, between the analyst and the philosopher, which we can see at work from her earlier books on the hysteric between Freud and Lacan, as well as on the place of madness in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant and its largely neglected relationship to Immanuel Swedenborg and his, uh, to use the title of Kant's uh, own work, Dreams of a Spirit Seer. Or more recently, her books on the construction of the universal and her deeply original inquiry into Deleuze and psychoanalysis. As we had a chance to appreciate on Tuesday, what Professor David Menard's work engages in is not a customary melding or clash between psychoanalysis and philosophy, as to theories of subjectivity, but rather a complex dialogue and articulation that takes the specificity and asymmetry of these theoretical practices seriously. And which in particular underscores the irreducibility of the clinical situation and of its interpretive interventions into sex, sexuality and gender to philosophical reduction. In advancing this novel articulation between philosophy and psychoanalysis, 
and then further complicating their entanglement by inviting anthropology and legal theory into the conversation, as she will today, Professor David Menard has made a unique contribution to a project that she herself, in the construction of the universal, encapsulates with a passage from Nietzsche's Daybreak, where he writes, we have to change our way of judging if we are finally able, perhaps after a long time, to go one better and change our way of feeling. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Minel to deliver her second Goldsmith's Annual Philosophy Lecture. Thank you very much to all of you. I am very happy and a little anxious because I don't know if this bizarre thought will make sense for you, but you, you will say that. So the idea of describing human reality <clears throat> on the basis of things instead of individuals, subjects, or even relation between individuals draws from several sources in my thinking. First, the way in which our contemporaries ask questions about politic, politics by starting most of the time with the notion of right, which confronts an unjust situation with the demands of individuals or group of individuals. The question of individual freedom confronted by the injustice of de facto situations that society reserves for them is then the presupposition for both legal theories and philosophies of emancipation. Whether we start like the legal theorists with the idea of freedom of the will, or whether we start with the idea of emancipation, we always start with individuals or individual agency while confronting them with a collective that is represented by rules and by confronting their affects to forms of power. In so doing, we forget that social relations are acted out as much through things as through demands for freedom. We don't stop talking about relation between human, between human beings by talking about things. On the contrary, we often neglect those aspects of human relation that are only formed through things. There are three parts in my talk. First, Hegel, on property right, is that an animism? Secondly, I will give uh, and I will give two examples in anthropology, and then I return to the problem of thing and the other and object and relation in uh, psychoanalysis. So. The second source for this work on things is a patient reading of Hegel. From his very first works, uh, before 18,000, then from Phenomenology of the Spirit up to the element of philosophy of right, his focus was on the importance of that moment when the spirit is at once fulfilled and alienated through social things, not just items of property that are governed by abstract right, that is the Hegelian term, abstract right, not just natural material transformed through labor, but also the object of language and institution, a political constitution, a theater, an inherited house, the Egyptian pyramids, a book put into circulation among reader, readers who understood it differently 
from the person who wrote it. For Hegel, these are things. That is to say, they are characterized by the fact that they are precisely not governed by the individual will that only intercedes as one of the moment of the thing, a moment that proved to be illusory as that thing has multiple facets that the will does not control. In Hegelian term, we will say that the moment of the thing is when the spirit becomes external to itself and fremdu and self-alienated Yet it is also a moment when human, relation, human relations takes, take form. The moment of the thing is the most silent moment of the relations that uh, human establish which is other. Through it, they, they relation become real. The term for real is wirklich. And Hegel uses for seeing ding, which emphasize the raw, silent materiality of these media for alienation. Logically speaking, the materiality of the thing makes possible that the contradictory determination of each being exists through a something, through a design according to the category in the science of logic. But he also uses the term Sache when he analyzes the forms of materiality that are not simply physical, but more connected to what is already caught up in the movement of social relations. For example, the organization of a company that has a headquarter, in French we said, le siège d'une compagnie. Le siège had to, has to do, does have to do with the back and headquarter with the head. For Hegel, there are several registers of materiality, each being a response to how what to how what is known as spiritual activity becomes estranged from himself while at the same time becoming real. He also shows that this actual reality of the thing returns to it from outside. There is opacity in the thing and yet interhuman recognition make use paradoxically of that opacity, even if this means contradicting the way in which the will thinks it finds itself with the thing. In philosophy of right, Hegel is particularly interested in one of the form of reified materiality, that of property. Being a property owner, means asserting that my will resides in an inanimate object to which it is identical, identical while being metaphysically foreign to that object. A will is a spiritual initiative, whereas the object is a thing. In modern democratic societies, this strange relation between wills and inanimate objects is to a large extent the matrix on which the very idea of the social order is built. Other people exist insofar as they recognize the identity of my will with things. The institution of inheritance of firms and guarantee and guarantees that kinship is passed down through things from which, in one sense, the spirit is absent, absent, yet that spirit governs them. 
I confront the blinding clarity of this philosophy of abstract right on the one hand with anthropological data on animism and on the other with psychoanalysis. The heterogeneity between will and thing that gives content and limit to the will is, a, is the criteria that Hegel uses to differentiate what ca can take the juridical form of property and what cannot. For example, I cannot reduce my neighbor to the state of a beast of, of burden since his living being for my will does not have the same exteriority as the exteriority that links my will to such a thing. I can be stoic by contrast, distancing myself from my body, that is to say, declaring and rendering effective the fact that my body and the chains that imprison it are not me as will. This metaphysical criterion leads Hegel to oppose himself to what has been called for a long time, for, exa for example, in private law, the distinction between property without usufruit, usufruct and usufruct. A property that would be completely distinct from the taking procession would not be property. Hegel thus critiques certain ju judicial document of Roman law. If we were to admit that a juridical person can be a property owner while all usage of the things would be the, prer the prerogative of another, we would be dealing with, he said, a madness of juridical personality. For the same reason, it justifies that anybody can have goods without masters at their disposal. Certainly, you, you, you can think at the empty apartment in a city and so on. Certainly, property as title and as usage are relatively distinct, but they cannot be completely dissociated, he said Hegel, since it is a thing and its users that give the will its reality. The examples are quite interesting. Public monument become masterless is if the state does not do anything about them. That is to say, if it does not materialize itself by the social and political use it makes of them. Inversely, there are things whose materiality is too rich and too spiritual to be able to take the form of this paradoxical link between will and thing. Such is the case with the works of writers or artists. Their family would like to reduce them to private property, but it becomes masterless for a reason opposite to the one that intervenes in the case of public monument, monuments. Their content becomes universal and thus no longer has a limited character of a thing. The exteriority and the limitation of the thing it is also the reason for which Hegel excludes as a juridical slavery, servitude, the alienation of religion, intelligent in the service, the alienation of intelligent in the service of another will from what he calls ethical sense. Personality cannot be the object of the will of another. This subtle gap between property and usage allows one to judge the limit of right itself for Hegel. 
illustrated in particular in the right of intellectual property. A work is by itself too homogeneous to the will that produced it for it to be private property. This do, does not mean that intellectual property right does not exist. It means that it always fails partially, which is manifested regularly in conflicts concerning the inheritance of words. By contrast, right indeed succeeds in regulating the reproduction of invention and works by technologies that make of produce things so many copies of the original works. works. The printer allows a work to circulate in a way completely independent of the creative will, and this materiality wholly justified that the circulation of works fall under the jurisdiction of property law. Property right then lies off of these very gaps that make the specificity of certain things go behind what property can do. This activity immanent to right as the active putting in form of social relation fails sin since the starting matrix, the face-to-face between will and things encounters its limit but the the right in fact makes that social experience this is what the expression abstract right means we also know the famous text in which hegel affirms against kant that marriage is not a contract because he uh, the first part of the theory has to do with possession and property and usage of the property. And then uh, Hegel uh, do the same for the contract. The contract is an exchange of property, the, a property change of hands. And uh, he asked, in which social activity does have the contract validity? He said, for example, that marriage is not a contract sin since the community of relation that makes up its reality is too rich, too concrete to be taken up in some way in the contra contractual form. There are too many elements in the relation between husband and wife for the property form to contain these relations. Or again, there is no social contract, that is the, the critique uh, to Rousseau. There is no social contract that can be said to found the political body. The act by which the collective body, that is the state's makes up the very substance of individuals is too real to be put into, into form by a contract that would make of the political body an association of individuals, etc. What is important in these various examples is that Hegel's reasoning is the same for public monument, property, labor, marriage. Property rights by their very insufficiency introduces to more concrete and complex form of social institution. The debate of things in property, in property right is useful because of its relative impotency. It is an adventure, a collective adventure that fails. 
violation of right are, according to Hegel, the manifestation of this failure. It is on the basis of this impossible point or of this point of impossibility of its power that property right situates in contrast the density of social relation. Perhaps is this reading of Hegel a Lacanian mode of reading? That is to say, it's precisely the point of the inadequacy, the impossibility for property right to give a shape for a complex social relation which makes him relevant. Then what say the anthropologists on these property things or the things who are not involved in the property right? In any case, this revitalized reading of Hegel establishes a relation with the third source from this essay, for this essay on the importance of things, anthropology. The anthropologists of societies that they refer to as non-modern often consider societies they don't yet understand by means of the description of objects that are produced, cultivated, exchanged, and or hidden. But this is not just a question of method in the approach to what is hard to understand. This latter characteristic of seeing, of being hidden or hidden away, is asserted as a decisive one by, for example, by Maurice Godelier. In his work on the Barouya, in Papua New Guinea, he shows that most of the relation of power and domination of men over women among the Barrians are recorded by means of simple signs or complex signs, it would be better, on stones, complex signs on simple stones known as Shuringa that are hidden away in sacred places. The men only take them out during, the men only take them out, excuse me, during initiation ceremonies for young boys. The point of this is to introduce the boys to the origin of their powers and prerogatives, which must remain sacred as though forgotten, so that the social hierarchy may renew themselves. In addition, the exchange of objects take, takes several forms among the Baruyas. So a society is not like the first Lévi-Strauss, a mode of exchange, a, a structure of a uh, signifier and a mode of exchange of uh, women. The problematic of how the society reproduces itself is uh, larger than the problematic of the alliance. And uh, in, a, in addition, the exchange of objects takes several forms, not just the form that Marcel Mauss privileged under, under the name potlatch, which confers of seeing the roles of objects to be sacrificed in the struggle for prestige between chiefs, but also many other forms of exchange, moka, kula, kitum, etc that combine objects and social relations. But Godelier finds the Shuringa interesting 
because he said they are political object through the secret existence and materiality of these forgotten stones, the unity of the roles and social hierarchy among the Barrias is summarized and handed down. The materiality is a law that the power relation and the domination of men uh, on women become both active and forgotten. These stones are the agent of the political unity of Baruya society. Here, Godelier is Hegelian. Politics is the production of unity among all social relations. He is not uh, like Foucault, and he is not like Marilyn Stratton, we will see. A society is therefore not just a system of alliance, a system prohibiting incest that turns women into objects to be put into circulation, like the signifier of a language. A society, according to Godelier, is a mode of transmission and not only a mode of alliance. And that for the inanimate objects are socially important. They are strange objects whose meaning is kept secret that control the transmission of that which does not participate is in exchanges. There are things that control the reproduction of that society. It seems to me that this moment of the silent of object is as crucial for Godelier as it is for Hegel, because it encapsulates and shapes social relation. Of course, Godelier does not adopt Hegelian metaphysics. He doesn't say that the spirit becomes self-alienated and external to itself in nature therefore becoming real. But the important assigned to things and object is the same, and it short circuits the consciousness of the member of the society. The importance of things is to get the member of a society to enter into relations that are not governed by consciousness and will. A more uh, among those in France who are familiar with the work, work of Marcel Mauss, uh, sociologist and philosopher Bruno Carsanti has shown in his uh, doctoral uh, work, L'homme total, sociologie, anthropologie et philosophie chez Marcel Mauss, uh, has shown that in the system of the gift, through a social lie into which they are laid, the members of a society become social individual, individuals. They think they are giving, but they are in fact participating in an obligation to give, to receive, to give back, that makes them social individuals. So individuals are formed by the social in a process which produces something unconscious or unknown. The moment of the individual being is the, the moment of the social life. And this process do have to do with objects and with relation. According to Marilyn Stratton, Stratton, this is particularly relevant when we explain what the property is in different societies. So, in an article um, entitled The Patent and the Malaga in Theory, Culture, and Soci Society, 2001, the object described 
by Marilyn Strutter under the name Malagans, condense morning rituals, the transmission of goods and capacities to the one who had just passed away, and the invention of a new social relation between the group and these who pretend to give a pathway to a dead person transformed who must be transformed into ancestry. These statues or this mask, which appear to us as composite, composite serve first of all to give a body to the one who has just passed away. When a member of the group dies, they must be given a body or skin so that they can become the ancestor of other bodies present who will inherit their capacity, goods, and talent. Such a mask, for example, possesses a general appearance of a head, but upon which are posed numerous small sculpture of snakes, bird, fish, and for example, the wings of a parrot. What is important here uh, at first for Marilyn Stratton has to do with the organization of space and time in that society. What is important is that we neither know when we see the Malagan, we neither know the background nor which bodies are fixed upon which background. This is the first point that Strathern treats since it subverts the distinction between depth and surface and thus also the distinction between interior and exterior both of which shape our conception of space. This disruptive visual character requires, according to Strathern, a conception of in inhabitation that ignores our distinction between natural mind, as well as our pretension to master our technology and our knowledge. We indeed believe to stand over and against nature, and we believe that our technology accentuates this position. And property right sanctions it by making believe, by the politing of patent, in the distinction between nature and technology. Nature, indeed, in Euro American society, is what is what is what cannot be patented. This is why the Malagans are puzzling. We do not know what is enveloping what when we see them. It is a subtle invention that say that our ancestors indeed inhabit, uh, inhabit us as much as we succeed them when we prepare a body for them. This technique of the fabrication of Malagans equally defies our conception of times. On the one hand, it might take many years before people that claim to have a right to carry on with what the deceased person was or did, materialize that which links them to this death by inventing a statute. On the other hand, this technique is also an institution that we will qualify as cultural. I quote, the technical ritual process of carv carving and painting does not produce enduring things as we might think of artistic works. As a thing, the body is not allowed to remain in existence. Rather, 
like technology, which combines knowledge, material form, and effectiveness, the reproduction of the Malagan body makes it possible to capture, condense, and then release power back to the world. End of quote. In that ritual, those aspiring to a succession to, to a succession are not alone, and therefore too. Uh, it's a cultural institution. They appeal to a sculptor to whom they express the idea of what links them to the one who is not yet an ancestor. It is the artist that gives form to their, to their idea. Finally, the time of transmutation of capacities of the deceased person contained in the fabricated object is paradoxical with respect to our modern customs, since the Malagan is not built to last, but to be destroyed, contrary to our technical object. In fact, when the mask has united or the statue or the carving object, has uh, when the mask has united in it all of the capacities of dead body, and when they are transferred to other member of the group, or even she said to member of other group groups, this object then has fulfilled its function, and then it is destroyed. Stra Strather notes humorously that the inhabitants of New Ireland quickly learned that one way to rid that same or themselves of Malagans was to sell them to uh, Europeans and Americans who would put them on display in museum. The deceased also produce also new relation of exchange due to this sale. The question Marilyn Strathern addresses to us concerning this ritual of mourning and transmission is, I quote, what is then so distinctive in the functioning of this power that must be placed in a body before being able to liberate it. And that is especially the case in New uh, Irelander. The New Irelander do not ignore the distinction between interior and exterior but they make a totally other use of it than we do in our technique and our rights. The technique of the Malagans had the power to transmit and allocate in a new way the capacities of a dead one in social relations. And since exteriority is not any less natural, the anthropologists poses the same question to moderns and no moderns. And I, I think this question is very interesting. How do we separate ourselves from what we produce? And what is the separation is abstract right? And what is the separation uh, in the technique technology, social technology of the Malagan. The new Irelanders materialize a provisional new body for a deceased person and abandon it as soon as it has served to redefine social capacity. We, on the contrary, regulate by way of intellectual property right all the more complex all the more complex in the age of contemporary technology, 
what goes to the inventor owner and what goes to the user that buy licenses to make use of the capacity created by the owner and the object. I will not speak on vaccines, but naturally uh, we think uh, about this question. This is also a mode of social transmission and repartition, but these practices don't have relation with the transformation of a dead body into an ancestor. And then the problem is, do we have a relation with the death in the mode of a, a transmission of a property object. And which relation? Strathern said, we have a more linear mode of transmission. I quote, I deliberately echo the new Ireland analysis. We might say that the pattern results in a form the potency of information made product through which technological is also channeled to the future. Malagan transform living and ancestral agency. Uh, Stratham uh, uses the term agency, who is uh, very often very often used in. Uh, uh, Anglo, uh, Anglo American philosophy and uh, anthropology. And I ask always is this agency something personal or not? So, Malagan transform living and ancestral agency, the one into the other. Patent imply a more linear series of conversions, intangible ideas onto enforceable property rights in the place of enveloping clan with ancestral potency at one inside and outside. Everyone, English speaker, instead accord nature a similar regenerative and recursive potential. Patent perpetuate the concept of nature. So these practices uh, invent social needs, but we don't know. It's impossible for us to realize that directly. Due to this juridical uh, end of quote, pattern perpetrates the concept of nature, end of quote. Due to these juridical rituals, we are under the belief that we oversee technologies. But on the contrary, Stratton said, they inhabit us just as the ancestor inhabit those who invent the Malagan. Our modern myth is that property has lost the meaning of what it is to inhabit the world. I quote, the manner in which Euro-Americans attach things to themselves makes them at home in the world, whether contained by technology or by nature, from which they think such things are coming. Ownership is a kind of second skin in comparison with the Malagan to these two containers, a world through which people are infinitely interconnected through the inclusion and exclusion of property relation and in which possession is taken to be at once a natural drive and the just reward of creativity. When we go, uh, end of quote, when we compare Godelier and Stratham, we can say that the multiplicity of function and aspect of the social things are unsecret according to Strathern. 
and Stratton in, insist regularly uh, not both on object but on relation, not both no, not on subject, individual subject, and not on object, but she uh, she demonstrates uh, in many uh, articles and books that they are relation only, but in another uh, sense that uh, strictly uh, structuralist sense. Both Godelians and Strathern emphasize that objects are always relation in a society, but Godelier gives a political importance to the secret contained in chewing gas, where Strathern insists on relation in Malagans. Strathern never isolates things nor individual subject. How could we compare this with the animistic character of the Freudian in conscious. What, what is what Freud call, call, calls animism of the unconscious? The last source for this revitalized interest in things is my attentiveness to the function of object of desires and drives in psychoanalysis. This attentiveness is both, as I tried to demonstrate uh, last uh, Tuesday, clinical and theoretical. For both Freud and Lacan, the singularity of unconscious desires plays out in the relationship to object as early as uh, uh, 18,995, uh, Freud said, I quote, what we call things are residues which await being judged. Was wir Dinge nennen, sind Reste, die sich der Beurteilung entziehen. End of quote. In the tradition of Franz ben Brentano and Aristoteles, he used the term judgment to refer to the act of thought and also to the movement by which a child or an adult thinks and acts in the hope of rediscovering what once brought us, brought him pleasure. Freud give two examples always, an adult who seeks and cultivates closeness to a sexual object and the child are at their mother's breast, breast who seeks to recapture the first time. The breast adopts certain characteristics of, assimilates certain characteristics of the object its form, perhaps it color, its color, its odor, but a part of what it seeks, it seeks remain unfamiliar. This unfamiliar part, which remain stable, the German expression is beisammen bleibt, resté ensemble, which remains stable, as it is not assimilated by the mind is what we call a thing. Lacan radicalized the relationship between thing with a big T or C and object. For Freud, the thing with the small uh, T, the thing, the prehistoric other in relation to which desires are formed is threatening even at his resembles a fellow human being I never mentioned. He characterizes that other as extraneous help, friend de Hilfe, and the helping power, helfen de Macht. For Freud, the relationships between, on the one hand, the objects that are thought in the domain of the other and 
on the other, the opaque, unfamiliar side of the stick that remain off of reach are flexible. Objects are aspects of the thing, aspects that judgment assimilates, adopts, in other words, that the subject incorporates, makes its own. And for one part, cannot make its own. Lacan makes the thing something more sweetening than helpful. For him, the object is what causes desire, but that object returns to the desiring subject from the unfamiliar other. In love, in the experience of mourning and in an analysis, this ordeal of being confronted with oneself as something irreconcilable, intruding from outside, is precisely how one becomes a subject. Therefore, the unfamiliar thing has something to do with what produces a subject of desire while at the same time dividing that subject from itself. In psychoanalysis, a complex relationship exists between the thing of desire and the object we find attractive. Some object derived from other human or from things associated with them seems to possess our being or our identity to which we ourselves do not have direct access. Because of this, they possess a kind of opacity that divides the subject from itself. But let's return for a moment to Freud and to the explicit problematic of animism. Yet Freud goes as far as to say that what he calls the unconscious is simply this combination of opacity and identification that also characterizes our relationship to what we call ourselves. The unconscious is our own form of anim animism since we cannot be animists in the same way as people from what he calls norm, uh, primitive society and we can say non-modern society. Let's look more closely at how Freud considers this relation between object thing, externality, and animism. One of the least read texts among psychoanalysts can be found in Freud's well-known article, The Inconscious, in uh, 1915. Uh, At the end of the part entitled Justification for the Concept of the unconscious. Uh, excuse me a minute. I need. At the end of this part, he attempts to counter the philosophies of consciousness and Descartes, especially, by demonstrating the necessity of accepting feelings, psyche, and acts as unconscious. In general, said we accept that the existence of someone else is given to us through an inference, the, ter the German term is Schluss, that we draw, in other words, through an act of judgment. The allusion to Descartes, in particular to the metaphysical meditations, is clear. We see hats and coats passing by, and through an act of conscious understanding and will, we judge by analogy that they are men. But Freud immediately replaces the term inference and reasoning with that of identification. This 
correction is what leads to the reference of animism. And after that, he adds, I quote, this inference or this identification was formally extended by the ego to other human beings, to animals, plants, inanimate objects, and to the world at large, and proved serviceable so long as they so long as their similarity to the individual ego was overwhelming grief. But it became more untrustworthy in proportion as the difference between the ego and these others widened. Today, our critical judgment is already in doubt on the question of consciousness in animals. We refuse to admit it in plants and we regard the assumption of its existence in inanimate matter as mysticism. But even when the original inclination to identification has withstood, withstood criticism, that is, when the others are our, uh, our neighbor mentor, the assumption of a consciousness in them rests upon an inference and cannot share the immediate certainty which we have of our consciousness. This text is very complex because uh, the end of the text is the description of Descartes. We, we believe that it's through uh, reasoning that we uh, judge that the other people uh, are like us. And what is for me interesting is that naturally the, there is a rest of evolutionism by, uh, by Freud we cannot uh, accept. But uh, the, this idea that there, there are primitive peoples or they were primitive peoples, but uh, what is for me interesting is that there is no, we don't know in the text through which cause, through which process, the situation changed. Uh, it pay, but it became more untrustworthy in proportion as the difference between the ego and this other widened. It's not, a, it's not a personal process, and it's not finished because what he calls unconscious, we will see, is that we have to ourselves the same uh, unconscious, the same uh, relation to the others. Freud then adds that, that psychoanalysis merely requests that this non-belonging to consciousness be extended to the ego under the name of the unconscious. The hypothesis of unconscious is the following, the act and expression that I note within me without the ability to associate them with the rest of my psychic life must be judged as though they belong to another person. This other person is not a split personality like by Pierre Janet. That other person it's what remains of the animism we no longer practice toward the other animate and inanimate objects. So it then concludes the psychoanalytical assumption of unconscious mental activity appears to us on the one hand 
As a further expansion of the primitive animism, which co caused us to see copy of our own consciousness all around us, and on the other hand, as an extension of the correction undertaken by Kant of our views on external perception. I think that no one anthropologist uh, and no one psychoanalyst could, could accept the idea or this primitive animism. I will, I will uh, uh, demonstrate rather that animism is always in our world and uh, it's not a rest of something primitive, for example, and therefore I began with uh, Hegel, the abstract right, one of the most cultivated uh, uh, institution uh, in, in right is something animistic. We should note the correlation of the two references by Freud. The unconscious is the animist relationship to what we call ourselves, and this relationship is no more or no more or less personal and unifying than, than the identification of primitive with animals, plants, and inanimate objects. This mixture of extreme closeness and alterity, it was makes Freud say that the unconscious is what well, is left of animism ever since we were no longer able to be animist. I will be less insistent in the uh, last quotation on Freud's ironic tone concerning philosophy, uh, the allusion to Kant, which deserves a study of its own. He is always polemic and ironic against philosophy and concentrate more on this opaque obviousness of our identification for with ourselves. Is this opacity the same one that is introduced into social relation by, by means of things, or is it of a different nature? And to what extent does property, seen as identical to the subject, produce an impoverished idea of animism in privileging an animism of the inanimate? This is what the anthropologist uh, Marilyn Strathern asserts is a strong and possible term. Any words to conclude, provisory conclusion? This anthropological way of reconsidering property allows me to clarify the varying importance of inanimate objects in either modern or non-modern societies. As you know, contemporary anthropology in the work of Marilyn Strathern, but also that of uh, Godelier, of Philippe Descola, Viveros de Castro, and Christine Taylor and others, showed that the distinction between nature and culture is a European invention. This is seen, for example, in the philosophical importance of Stratton, Stratton's short statement, I quote, the moderns call nature that which cannot be patented. So the relationship to object, in particular inanimate object, is anything but natural, if natural means spontaneous, pre-established before any socialization. In asserting this, I will not merely mean that to say that nature is a social construct as Bourdieu would put in. Instead, 
I wish to point out that the most unconscious aspect of sexuality and social relations and right involves the inanimate. The inanimate is something social. This means that the word inanimate in the sense of things and objects is not grounded in the difference between the dead and the living, but in the use of what is non-transparent, opaque in sexual and social life or possibly is not only grounded in the difference between the dead and the living, but in use of what is non-transparent, opaque in sexual and social life. Among the moderns, this opacity is concentrated in the institution of property. In saying this, we necessarily allude to those political philosophers who have criticized property, particularly in capitalist societies, as the opposite of a social relation, since is it an exclusionary one? Marx natural, uh, naturally, <laughs> Marx naturally had read the chapters in Hegel on abstraction of right. But commodity fetishism is not the only opaque creation in a society. And it is impossible to hope for the end of this concealing function that is also, as Hegel said, self-alienation in things. The point is to know how the opacity of inanimate objects acquires a specific, fun a specific function in each society. This then makes it possible to judge to what extent property is probably worse than other ways of dealing with object in a social context. Probably worse, not only because it leads to the belief that the principle of the individual is, is what hold society together, but also because it puts an end to the circulation of objects that establish relation between transmission, artist, and the memories of those who speak of death to the artist as seen among the people of New Ireland in Papua New Guinea, for example. How can the social use of object be restricted so that it does not make us believe that such use is limited to transmission by inheritance, by birth right or blood rights? Let's recall the way in which Lévi-Strauss in La Pensée Sauvage describes a family visit to a notary when one of the family member has the deed. The right of the succession of notarial act transferring property from one owner to the next consists in instilling, instilling the belief that something passes from a person who has deed to a living person by way of object. And yeah. Furthermore, once direct inheritance is established, this right leads to the belief that the blood is the shared substance, making it possible to guarantee through procreation the passage of that object into other hands. Isn't this this practice just as isn't this practice just as animist as those that we investigate in non-modern society? And isn't this way of envisioning the collective just as savage as those that we can savage for so long? After all, this practice selects 
blood relation to both unify generation and envelop the nuclear family within the social order while tying individuals and things together. The whole question of Oedipus and the universality of that question should be reconsidered on the basis of this point. Another question deserves clarification on the epistemological level. As we have encountered several forms of this opacity of things, we may now raise this question in these three domains, legal, psychoanalytic, and anthropological. Is the opacity the same? Correlatively, is there a single discipline that can explain the status of this opacity of seeing in each domain. For example, when Lacan invented the theory of the four discourses, the discourse of the masters, the hysteric, the university, and the analyst, he tried to show how the object of desire derived from the seeing the object of jouissance circulate in various ways within this social relation called discourses. This shaping is interesting as it demonstrates how the object the cause, as cause of desire is always an excluded term except in the analyst discourse. The limit to this theory is that it seems to reduce social relation, relations to the exclusion of knowledge and juices and to the way that the various discourses negotiate that exclusion. Lacan seems to replace Marx's surplus value Merveillette with surplus jouissance, as if a society consisted merely of the relations that he calls the extimacy of knowledge and jouissance. On the contrary, I think that the opacity of things is not the same in the social sciences and in psychoanalysis. No meta language dominates the various forms of opacity of things that we deal with in right anthropology and psychoanalysis. And yet, it is true that the things that permit the, inter the interrelation of social object and object of desire remain secret or prove inadequate. In our practice as analysts, this relationship between the destinies of drives and socio-cultural relation is called sublimation. And we are fully aware that there is a gap in the way in which the deadlocks of neurosis and psychosis are transposed, transposed into what social relation or cultural frameworks offer as new solution to the problem of subjectivity. The social sciences describe social relation without taking an interest in how unconscious sexuality comes into contact with this relation. But in psychoanalysis, social relations and relation to otherness cannot be overlaid upon each other. And yet, the gap between them allows for their interaction. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, just one second. So um, thank you so much for this incredibly rich um, 
um, presentation. I mean, let me just make sure that technically we're all here. Okay. Um, so, um, one second. Okay. Um, I would now like to uh, introduce you to our respondent this evening, uh, Professor Alan Potage. Um, Potage is Professor of Law at the Sciences Po in Paris, prior to which he was Professor of Law at the Lenin School of Economics, as well as visiting professor at Cornell, the OHSS, Frankfurt, Harvard, and Sydney. A specialist in questions in the history and theory of intellectual property and on the question of law in the Anthropocene, He's the author of numerous writings, including an edited volume on law, anthropology, and the constitution of the social, a book on figures and invention that looks, among other things, at the materiality underpinning modern patent law, and a contribution to a special issue of theory, culture, and society on the work of Marilyn Strathern entitled Law After Anthropology, Object and Technique in Roman Law. He is currently working on a book on the history of literary property. Thank you, Professor Potish, and over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Julia, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Monique for having been so generous in sharing uh, her book uh, with me and uh, drafts of the lecture. And above all, Monique, thank you for giving me the occasion to read your wonderfully rich book. On Tuesday, uh, you characterized the book as being Baroque. Um, and I think for me, one of the manifestations of its Baroqueness came out in your introduction because in a sense of, of the prominence that you give to the figure of opacity, um, in a sense, the, the work could actually be a work on opacity <laughs> um, rather than objects. And opacity is figured in different ways in, in, in the book as materiality in, in, the most, in the largest sense, as the unconscious, as heterogeneity, as contingency, and ultimately as what you call uh, l'inassimilable constituant, um, this idea of a sort of materiality that is unavailable to the subjectivities it articulates. Um, and these different figures of opacity, in a sense, articulate the different registers that you hold in play in the book. The register of, uh, or the scene of analysis, the legal institution of property, and also importantly, the politics of locality, in a sense, mm -hmm. that you emphasize very much in the book. So here law is taken as a kind of medium of what you call institutional, morality, institutional materiality. <laughs> And this, this brings us on to ground that I like, uh, but it's rarely seen as being of generalized interest, namely the body of private law, property and, and contract. So Monique, I'm very taken by your characterization of property as being what you call a blurred knot of modes of subjectivation and political institutions. Mm -hmm. And ne embrouiller de mode de subjectivation et d'institution politique. Mm -hmm. um, some brief observations. I'm conscious we we're running out of time, so I'll be trying to be as quick as possible. I have some brief observations about that knot. And in particular, I want to pick up on the way in which um, your reading of Hegel connects with the anthropologies of Godelier, Descola, and Strathern. So to begin with Hegel, mm -hmm. uh, Monique highlights the point in Hegel's presentation of private right where he observes that certain features of Roman and civilian law property manifest what he calls a madness of the personality. The observation is prompted by the Romanist division between bare ownership and usufructory ownership, between an owner who has title to the corpus of the thing and an owner who is entitled to the use of the thing. And Hegel says, quote, here, the term mine, as applied to a single object, would have to mean both my exclusive individual will and another exclusive individual will with no mediation between them. And elsewhere, Hegel observes that the thing and its use are indissociable. Quote, a force only exists so far as it manifests itself. The field is a field only in so far as it produces a crop. Thus, he who has the use of a field is the owner of the whole and it is an empty abstraction to recognize any further property in the object itself. So here already, in the process of turning it into the medium of a kind of phenomenological adventure, Hegel has misunderstood law. This madness of personality is not a moment of ethical life that is left behind as private law fully comes to re realize or recognize what Hegel calls the freedom of property. It's a structural feature of Roman law and Euro-American law in general. 
Some time ago, the legal historian Yann Thomas asked whether or in what sense Roman law was a technical language. What was distinctive of law as a social technique or institution? Generations of Roman lawyers had believed that Roman law evolved by appropriating and adapting terms that were found ready to hand in religion, philosophy, ethics, and so on. And they believed that through this process of adaptation, new layers or folds of meaning accrued to these generic terms. So the language of Roman law became technical by inflecting or supplementing ordinary language, by adding a further indent to the dictionary entries for terms such as fides, or by inventing the jargon that is so often associated with law and which forms a kind of inelegant appendix, appendice inelegant, uh, to ordinary language. Now for Thomas, this understanding of legal language reduces technicality to terminology. It assumes that the syntax that controls the formation of legal propositions is the syntax of language at large, and that the meaning of most Roman legal terms could be discerned by philological analysis. In response, he argued that Roman law was an imminent structure that manifested itself in a linguistic structure. Le droit romain est une structure de contenu qui se manifeste dans une structure linguistique, le latin. So Roman law thoroughly re-engineered ordinary language, turning its components into elements that derived their value from the way that they were combined within a structure that resulted from the evolution of law as a specific institution which was intelligible only to those who were schooled in that structure. And not only did legal operations give a new and specific meaning to Latin words, generating what Thomas calls a neologisme de sens, they also, and more importantly, turned words into devices. According to Thomas, legal language is uniquely performative. By virtue of their normative force, or what Thomas calls their preceptivity, Legal statements have the capacity to bring things into being, to change states, to bind and unbind, to ascribe competences to persons or things, or indeed to create personality and thingness. So the distinction that bothered Hegel, the distinction between bare ownership and usufructory ownership, um, was not actually the, the end point <laughs> for Roman law. So to turn to another example that Thomas develops in a later work, in Roman law, it was not uncommon for testators to bequeath a particular slave to two owners. To divide ownership between a bare owner, who would own the person or body of the slave, and a usufructory owner, who would own only a right either, and this is important, either to the use, usus, or to the profits, fructus, of the slave. So notice the division of usufruct into usus and fructus. If the usufructory owner had the right of usus, then they could only put the slave to work within their own household. But if they had a right to the fruits of the slave, then they could hire him or her out to work for someone else under a contract of locatio operarum. This contract created a new and specific object of property, the labor time of the slave. When a person who owned a right to the fruits of a slave transferred that right to another person under a contract of locatio operarum, they obviously couldn't transfer a right in the body or person of the slave as such, because ultimately they had to restore the slave to the bear owner undamaged and undiminished. So what they could transfer was a thing, a raise that was legally severable from the body, namely this abstract legal category of labor time, a homogeneous, divisible, and numerically measurable period of time. And this measure of time, temporis messes, existed as a legal artifact distinct from the body or person. Now, there are things to be said about Thomas's uh, aestheticizing of law. And here we might notice that it emerged in part as a response to the peculiar hold that uh, the Kenyan psychoanalysis had and still has on French law through the influence of Pierre Legendre. Um, but it reminds us of some important points about law. First, by drawing attention to the specific epistemic density of law, it foregrounds a kind of material or materialized politics that is overlooked if we identify law only with adjudication. And if we think of adjudication in terms of the particular kind of politics that is at work in a Supreme Court decision. Second, it focuses our attention on the capacity, unique or not, I don't know, to produce artifacts and enact operations that are not informed by whatever might be imagined as the real existence of persons and things. 
law is not a failing representation of society or reality, but an operation of fiction in the old sense of fingere. Third, and here Monique's sense of knots and knotting is very apposite. The example of labor time illustrates the point that involuted as this process of discursive manufacture is, it still presupposes and is articulated into other strands of the knot. The category of labor time in Roman law would have been inconceivable and inoperable without the medium of money and the economic form of the price. And incidentally, Kant sees this more clearly than Hegel. Hegel's analysis of private right is a critical reading of Kant's doctrine of right, and it reproduces the order and some of the tabulations of that text. <clears throat> One of the things that Kant does in the um, Metaphysics of Morals is to recognize that a system of private right is incomplete without reference to money. So does Hegel. But Kant presents money explicitly as a medium. The question, what is money, is paired with the question, what is a book? Just as money was the greatest and most useful means that human beings had for the exchange of things, so the book was the greatest means for exchanging thoughts. The formal categories of and contract were traversed, animated, and importantly mediated by money. So although Hegel read Adam Smith just as closely as Kant, although he extensively analyzes value and price, and he ends up, I think it's in the Systeme de Sittlichkeit, calling money a monstrous beast, he misses out on this sense of mediation and communication, which implies its own madness of the personality. Because if the vocation of things is to be transmuted into value and price, then in law, the contemporary iteration of madness is first found less in the law of things than in the law of persons. While Hegel was writing, the law of the German states was evolving from a model of Wollmacht, a limited form of agency, to the model of Stellvertretung, a relation of substitutive representation, what in French is called la représentation parfaite, in which one person acts as if they were another. The contemporary world of finance and financialization would be impossible without that device. And if we shift our attention from objects to media, then it connects, in a sense, with my own work in terms of working on intellectual property, um, because you think about the ability of the medium of print, for example, to turn the living into ghosts and the ghosts into the living. Um, in any case, the point here is just that Hegel, that law is not what Hegel and political philosophy thought it was. And yet, ironically, this very involutedness, this very indifference, is what makes law available to this kind of analysis, and the, indeed invites this kind of proje projection. And that may be no bad thing. If whatever people like me have to say about, about the epistemic density of law, or with intellectual property in mind, about the nature of the articulations that produce things like books or the experience of reading, there is actually a generalized and effective cultural sense of property, a sense of mine and thine. And if that cultural sense can be leveraged to political effect by imagining the institution morality, materiality of law in novel ways, then so much the better. Now, something like that is going on in Mus's The Gift. Anthropologists and social scientists have been reading The Gift for almost a century and have, have evolved the various readings that we're now very familiar with. But from the perspective of legal history, the gift appears in a slightly different light. Moos wanted his ethnography of places he had read about but never visited to circle back into Europe. More precisely, he wanted the figures of reciprocity to contribute to a political project that passed through European law and its Roman origins. So Roman law plays a very important part in the strategy of the gift. Most was very attentive to the sense of social solidarity and mutuality that seemed to be emerging after the war of 1418, principally through forms of social insurance that he called a socialis socialism d'etat. In particular, he had in mind the situation of the worker who, as he put it, keenly feels that he exchanges more than a product or labor time, that he gives something of himself, his time, his life. And the social collectivity and the bosses could not defray this contribution simply by paying a wage. The worker was owed, quote, a measure of security in life, 
against unemployment, against sickness, against old age and death. So for Mus, a revolution was underway that recognized and gave effect to these more persistent obligations, obligations which had so far been repressed by a particular kind of juridical form, which insisted on the difference between persons and things. So to quote from the gift, we live in societies that draw a strict distinction, qui distingue fortement, between real rights and personal rights, things and persons. This division is fundamental. It constitutes the essential condition for a part of our system of property, transfer and exchange. Yet, are not such distinctions fairly recent in the legal systems of our great civilizations? Did these not go through an earlier phase in which they did not display such a cold calculating mentality? The legal distinction between persons and things or between personal rights and real rights was the servant of this cold calculating mentality because it disguised the sense in which all exchange presupposes, participates in and reproduces the social. So one of the objects of Moses' representation of other people's laws of giving and receiving was to equip European society with a vocabulary, a sensibility that would enable it to reconnect with, to reactualize, to reflect on itself in terms of these deep moral principles. He says, it is not enough to notice the tendency towards collectivization and solidarity. One has to deduce from it a practice, a moral precept. We have to say that this revolution is a good thing. Il faut dire que cette révolution est bonne. One of the objects of the gift, as most put it, was to cause another juridical music to resound. That's a terrible translation. <laughs> to, de faire résonner une autre musique juridique. To just think of what, you know, to resonate, to resound, to echo through, retentir, se prolonger, just to unfold some of the connotations of résonner. This other music was generated by the ethnography and then resounded through contemporary legal forms. And it did so by activating residues of Roman law. Through Davy and Uvelin, Moss was very well acquainted with one of the big legal historical debates of the day, which concerned the nature of the archaic Roman institution of Nexum, debt bondage. The extended footnote on Nexum is key to understanding the influence of that debate on the project of the gift. In the early 20th century, one legal historian called this debate about Nexum volcanic. I mean, you probably had to be a legal historian to feel the seismic effects, but it was, you know, it was the thing in early 20th century legal history. Um, in the form of Nexum, most founds in the archive, in the memory of European law, an archetype of a transaction in which person and thing are not always already distinct, in which person is embodied in thing, in which a transaction is not a punctual event, but is iterated through time. If, as most says of the ethnographic material, this morality and organization still function in our own societies in unchanging fashion, and so to speak hidden below the surface, then the loop back into Roman law reactivated this morality. In fact, there's a kind of double loop um, that the ethnographic material loops back into Europe via the archaic. So there's sort of, you know, this, yeah, whatever, <laughs> um, yeah, in intercalation of loops. So the comparative moment is productive. I'm very taken with the specific move made by Monique, which is to make Hegel Euro-American by splicing his analysis of abstract right into the anthropologies of Gurulier and Strathern. But I wonder whether we might push that move a bit further um, by beginning within Hegel. So one final point and then I'll conclude. According to Carl Schmidt, who is a good guide here precisely because he embodied anti-Semitic old Europe, the crucial section of Hegel's philosophy of right was paragraph 247, in which Hegel refers to the expansion of civil society beyond national boundaries and across the seas, and to the practical necessity of European expansion through colonization. According to Hegel, the sea as a means of communication, quote, supplies the means necessary for colonization, whether sporadic or systematic, to which the fully developed civil society is driven and by which it provides part of its population with a return to the family principle in a new country and itself with a new market and sphere of industrial activity. Now, leaving aside the difference that matters so much to Schmidt, namely the difference between the geomedia of land and sea, Schmidt situates the Hegelian system on the ground of jus publicum europeum, 
on ground in which the European was always already at home, or in somewhat Heideggerian terms, the ground of being that allowed Europeans to be in the ways that political philosophies suggested they should be. The system of ethical life has a geoontology that it presupposes but cannot include. Hegel's reference to the colonies in paragraph 247, 248 points towards this constitutive externality. As Schmidt points out, the internal sense and configuration of the state in the Jus Publicum Europeum is condi was conditioned by the relation to the external dimension of non-European lands open to conquest. What Hegel refers to as the expansion of civil society across the sea, as the medium that awakens commercial speculation, assumes that configuration. We know, principally through scholarship relating to Locke, that the architecture of European political philosophical conceptions of acquisition and possession emerged from the colonial encounter by way of fictions of the state of nature, fictions that obviously Hegel repudiated. But Schmidt's invocation of Hegel highlights a different kind of political and epistemic operation, one that was at work even before these fictions were formulated. As Schmidt observes in his Nomos, Europeans had always already appropriated the world simply by realizing the ground upon which any colonial encounter took place. So to quote from Schmidt, from the standpoint of the discovered, discovery as such was never legal. Neither Columbus nor any other discoverer appeared with an entry visa issued by the discovered princes. Thus, legal title to discoveries lay in a higher legitimacy. They could only be made by peoples intellectually and historically advanced enough to apprehend the discovered by superior knowledge and consciousness. What made lands beyond the sea available to conquest by Europeans, what legitimated the acts of demarcation and appropriation by which possession was manifested was the prior political, ethical and epistemic act of rolling out the geoontology of European societies to the rest of the world by means of cartographic technique. Hegel's colonists could return to the family principle in a new country and begin to practice the rules for the acquisition of property because the ground was always already European, it was always already a terri nullius to be. Cornelia Wissmann suggests that the project of creating the preconditions of original appropriation is perfectly exemplified in the operations of the Wehrmacht on the Russian front in World War II, which involved using a specific engine, the Schwellenflug, to tear up the railway lines that evidenced Soviet occupation. She says, quote, where no man's land did not exist, their mission was to produce one, precisely to produce desert zones. Their mission was to erase all lines in order to start from scratch. Before colonization comes the production of no man's land. In terms of my reflection on the knot of property, the point is that the Euro-American mode of knotting forms itself against a specific horizon of being. And this horizon of being has, as Schmidt saw, a property effect of its own. I, I say property effect in full cognizance of the fact that for Schmidt, nomos is not law. Um, it has a property effect of its own, a capacity to exclude and erase, to allow some people to feel at home and others to be, to be either invisible or vis visible as others to that space and to the sense of belonging that it engenders. In uh, the, 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 the System der Sichtlichkeit, Hegel says that the right to property is the right to law. Recht an, uh, an Eigentum ist Recht an Recht. The point is illustrated by the apparently paradoxical claim in the philosophy of right that alienation is a true mode of taking possession. And in other words, to transfer a thing to someone else is to assert possession of it. There are two reasons why this is not paradoxical. First, the act of relinquishing a thing is an effective synthesis of possession and use. Second, when you alienate a thing to someone else, that person not only acknowledges that you have title to that thing, they also in that process recognize your abstract legal personality, the personality invested in the thing. But what the symptomatic reference to colonization brings out, the sense in which the right to law is itself conditioned by another right, or perhaps not a right, a privilege, and still today a racialized privilege of being at home in a nomos.
Thank you very much. I'm going to bring Alberto here. Um, Monique, would you like to um, respond? Just a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Alain, for your response and for this apology of right. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, I will, I am not, I am critical against Hegel. What interests me uh, in Hegel is something, is the possibility to rethink in a new mode the problem between Mauss, for example, and Levi-Strauss. Is there something, I would say, magic in, in some institution who seems to be very rational? It's the same problem in Scientia Nova by Vico. Vico explained, and he is also a specialist of Roman law, as you say. He explained that uh, the Roman law is not something so rational that we mean. It's a transformation of violent situation, les actions de la loi, the act of the law transform situation of violence and the uh, equal value between crime and punishment doesn't change radically that. It's a little what Nietzsche uh, would say. So my problem is then, is it possible that, uh, and that is my thesis. I am not an Hegelian. I use Hegel in order to pose a question on rationality in, in social practices and today in the Hegelian theory of right, of property right, rationality and something we are tempted to call irrationality. But I think this distinction is not the good distinction. And for example, uh, the problem we I could uh, put the pro, pose the, the 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 same problem in reading Jan Thomas. Jan Thomas say, as you uh, remember to us, that the right is a performative invention, a fiction. And when, what is very interesting for me is in Les Operations du Droit, for example, when he carefully and so interesting uh, show which are the fiction. For example, in Roman law, I remember that an institution must have a personal owner. But he said in an abbey, in a I don't know how do you say abbey uh, in English. Abbey, just abbey. In a, in, in a, thank you. In an abbey, when, when all the priests die one after the other, what happened when nobody is there with the heritage of the abbey? And he showed how. Roman law invent a fiction uh, who you are right uh, it's a, a linguistic institution he said there is nothing uh, irrational or imaginary in this fiction it is the the, the rule of language, that is to say, metonymy. 
it's very interesting, but you have also metonymy in the, in the dream. Metaphors, metonymy are also in the dream. So to say metonymy doesn't, is not the uh, a final answer to the question, what is the status of the fiction? Uh, it's not enough to say it's the law of language and, and then there is nothing imaginary in it. That is my problem. Could it be possible that we, European, we, with all our con so intelligent construction, do have something something do have beliefs we don't see and therefore is anthropology uh, so interesting so it's not an apology of Hegel uh, philosophy of right what i say it's a new uh, uh, a renewal of the question between Mose and Levi Strauss i would say well, I don't know if Elam wants to sort of also, I don't know, <laughs> respond to the response while we wait questions from the audience. Maybe there are questions. I don't want to um, occupy time with this. Uh... None have been posted yet, so please. Uh... Yeah, I, I just specifically on the question of Thomas, I mean, I think there's a certain fascination that Thomas exerts. And I think the yes. fascination itself is an interesting phenomenon for me. Why is it so fascinating? And one of my hypotheses is that he turns law or the fabrication of law into something like a sort of asteroid that kind of lands on the planet from outer space. And, you know, you kind of look at this stuff and the way it's put together and it's not, it's alien. <laughs> it's very, it's very alien. This is kind of exciting in a sense to sort of, to, to, yes. And I think we can all be captivated by that. You know, on the point of fiction, of course, his point about fictions is that the law only, in a sense, ever answers questions that it asks itself. Um, and I think um, that sort of obviously, you know, gives rise to a whole set of questions. And it, maybe it works with Roman law, maybe it works with the casuistics of Roman law. But to say that contemporary was casuistic in that sense, I'm not sure. Um, and I think um, so, so I have a lot of questions about it, but I think there is a, cert a certain, um, uh, there's a certain, um, well, what a better word, truth <laughs> in what he says about law. Thank you. So again, you know, we'd like to invite anybody to, um, in the audience to, um, you know, pose questions in the Q&A function or just indicate that you'd like to speak. We have a couple minutes, <laughs> actually, <laughs> we don't have that much time. Um, there's, there's a question um, in the chat. Um, um, Catherine Pistor's Code of Capital. How would you see this in relationship to um, what you've been just discussing? Kat Katrina Pistor. I don't know okay. Katrina Pistor. Uh, it's uh, Astrid Deuber Mankowski who uh, say that, and she knows more than me about this question. <laughs> I cannot uh, give an answer, but she could probably. <laughs> Um, Ask, Astrid, would you like would you like to sort of elaborate on this? I'm gonna, if you'd like to speak and just like, yes, thank you so much, uh, all of you. C can you hear me? Oh. Yes, yes, very good. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. yes. First of all, I thank you a lot. It's absolutely, totally fascinating and interesting. And my impression was that Alain is speaking in a different way um, and relating in a very different way to the question of, of law than Monique. And I'm a little bit familiar with the media historical approach 
to those questions. And that's why I would be absolutely interested in how Alan, and I do not know exactly if Monique, you are familiar with this uh, book, very, very discussed book of Katharina Pistor, The Code of Capital, how you would relate to the concept of law he, she is uh, elabor uh, elaborating there. If I may, I, I think that for me, the codes of capital, I think is, it would be a kind of illustration or a sort of hyper contemporary, obviously, illustration of the, uh, the very sketched out observation I made about the um, intersection between, you know, legal operations and economic operations or legal form and economic form um, that I think is interesting. It's, you know, for me, it's, it's one of the interesting things about, uh, about uh, Kant, for example, and the, and the analysis of money. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's absolutely, it's absolutely, uh, it's, it would be absolutely pertinent, yes. Um, yeah. What, you know, Monique, or um, you know, <laughs> or, or has to like to like to um, elaborate or um... yeah, I must yes, and uh, but, but uh, I mean, if one would say or if one says that the European has always been there then uh, it is uh, not so easy to explain or to understand the way in which Katharina Pistor um, is arguing by saying that in different uh, societies, in not, you know, societies which are not dominated by, the, by the, this kind of, 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 of law of property, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, exactly there, um, 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 appears a form of opacity, so to say, in which things are different, uh, different um, 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 related to. And my question is <laughs> whether it would be not very interesting then to uh, have a different approach to, to Moss and all those anthropologist theories which is more like Monique would uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, propose. This, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to take that as being principally addressed to, to me because I was the one who was suggesting that, uh, you know, the, the world was always already European in yes. that moment. <laughs> I think, I think uh, what, I, what, I'm, what, what I'm trying to talk about in a sense is the imaginary of First of all, the imaginary of political philosophy, mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, the imaginary that sort of the generalized imaginary that kind of in a sense derives from these political philosophical representations, um, which obviously have to do with land. And I totally accept and take your point about, you know, in a sense, the the fact that property, in a sense, is no longer about land, um, and in a sense, no longer about things. Um, so, you know, one of the points about about Kant and money is that it kind of gets us towards the point that you see very, very clearly, for example, in the work of someone like Niklas Luhmann, who clearly says, you know, first of all, property is a medium of communication. And second, that it's all about, you know, money, uh, the ability to pay or, or not to pay. Um, and I'm, I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just, I'm just trying to suggest that you know, to the extent that there is a sense of exchange of things, of objects and so on, um, that it is very much um, grounded in, I think, um, this kind of, um, uh, th th this sort of expansion of this very specifically European space that erases and extinguishes um, all other senses of land. Um, uh, so so I, I, I kind of do see a decage between that question and that period and, and sort of the, uh, the sort of the, the question of, of money and accounting and so on that, uh, uh, that you're talking about. So I think we have maybe time for like one um like one final comment, but um, so Marilyn Strathern um, could I, would like to Could I to say add. something on uh, the intervention um, of uh, Astrid? Oh, yes, sorry, yeah, go on. Uh, uh, 
I know that <clears throat> in, in our times, the international lawyer uh, try to transform the construction of, of the right of the, while uh, the, the very notion of juridical personality uh, has to uh, accept, to, to assimilate, not only common property, for example, but uh, that a personality can be done in the right through a fiction um, to animals, uh, all what we need in order uh, to respect and transform in another manière the environment and uh, the, the distinction between nature and culture doesn't work uh, for this transformation of right and therefore I am interested in confronting, uh, for example, Malagan and Patton. It's true that uh, Hegel doesn't know nothing uh, on, on money, but uh, it's not the only problem. The problem is, can the right uh, be, how can the, philosophy of right now be changed in order to think behind its limits. This was also my, my point. And perhaps Catherine Pistor uh, gives some element to answer this question. I, I, I don't I don't have read uh, her book, but I will see. So, um, Marilyn? Uh, thank you very much. Um, th this comes from a rather different direction. Um, Monique, I just wanted to thank you tremendously for the forays you've been making into anthropology and, of course, not least into one or two things I've written myself. Um, I, I really welcome that. Since you asked me, a direct question, um, I thought I ought to answer it in, in public. Um, and this was in uh, relation to the, 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 the comment that, that the manufacture and then the discarding of the Malangan mm -hmm. uh, figure um, generates, uh, a, a, a generates a, a various kinds of virtual um, potencies. Um, and I used the word of uh, word ancestral agency, and you asked me, is the agency personal or not? Mm -hmm. This gets to the heart in the way of some of the differences that you've been dealing with, because what is at issue overpoweringly in the Papua New Guinean context is a concern with procreation, reproduction, fertility, regeneration. Mm -hmm. And these are the very topics on which we're so afraid to discuss. We have a very impoverished discourse, so to speak, for talking about um, uh, uh, regeneration and, and reproduction with all the, the um, uh, sexual and other overtones uh, that that carries for us. We, um, we, we, we compartmentalize it. And I was very interested that right at the end, you actually mentioned procreation in the context of, of a uh, sphere of activity that is sidelined, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm by the generativity we instead bestow on the notion of property and, and particularly um, uh, the notion of rights. So this agency of the ancestors is at, at once personalized in the sense that there are going to be specific figures that people recall, but also generalized in the sense that all a clan's ancestors um, have an interest in the, in the perpetuation of the, of the clan group and uh, uh, people fear um, that they will be cursed rather than blessed and uh, so forth. So 
the ancestors are indeed active and they are indeed um, agents, um, but of course can't be reduced simply to be um, uh, in individual, but they are personal agents um, in the same way as um, uh, the objects and relations, of course, are also personalized. Um, but I really just want, wanted to yes, thank you ever since your hearing your first lecture on Tuesday, the some of the equations between persons and things have been reverberating and I found it very productive. Thanks so much. Thanks you to you, Marie. Um, so yeah, Monique, which, you know, would you like to respond? For, um... No, no, I have nothing <laughs> to say for tonight. <laughs> okay, well, just thank you to all you and uh, uh, also to Ale and uh, I hope to read your uh, intervention if it's written. Is it written? Uh, I, I believe, uh, yes, it's not exactly. Yeah, what you said. But... <laughs> so we will continue. Absolutely, yes. Um, in this case, we'll, you know, we're, we're over time. So um, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, thank you, Monique, um, for a wonderful set of lectures. Um, and thank you, Alain, for, for responding. Um, and um, if, um, again, um, you'd be interested, any of the attendees would be interested in um, our um, future uh, program of the rest of the year, please do visit our website, cpcd.uk. Um, otherwise, um, have a good evening, everybody.